So let's have a good look at you. Good looking crowd. Looking rather prosperous. Anybody here flew around last night? <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> it's a nice place to do it though. I wish I had somebody, but I was alone in my room. Did anybody even know I was here? <laughs> it's a pleasure to speak with you. I wish I got a chance to know each of you better. You are my cup of tea all the way. I like nothing better than hanging out with great salespeople. I personally believe that salespeople are the most interesting people in the world. Never boring, always entertaining, always a bit insecure and annoying, always interviewing you when you think you're having a conversation, always lovely to spend time with when you're not living with them. I love salespeople. I'm going to tell you today about how I got started in the real estate business because my mother actually saw that one coming. And from there, I'm going to, if you would humor me, um, I'm going to take you on the journey of the things that made the biggest differences when I was building my business, the Corcoran Group in New York City. It was actually my second business. I had another business before that. And I had 22 jobs before I was a real estate agent. But my favorite business in the world is real estate for all the reasons I'm sure you stay with it, fully engaged with it, and make your very good living doing it, or you wouldn't be here from everything I heard about who was attending. This, this particular conference. So I'll start with where I grew up, which you gotta start somewhere, but I happen to grow up uh, with a set of parents that were uh, perfect for me. And how lucky was I? I didn't know it then how lucky I was, but looking back, thank God when you get a lucky parent who loves you. But I happen to get two. I had my mom on one side, my dad on the other. So I was doubly blessed. And we grew up in a little town called Edgewater, which is right across the river from New York City right at the foot of the George Washington Bridge on the riverbank. And it was one mile long, two blocks wide. And we had the biggest family in town and we felt famous. We had tons of Catholics in that town. They were either Irish or Italian. And uh, we had the biggest by one kid. So we felt proud of that. My mother put her six girls in the girls' room painted it pink, her four boys in the boys' room painted it blue. And then my mom and dad produced every one of those kids from the living room couch. You don't need romance, right? So for Catholicism and the Pope. My mother's greatest gift to each of us, other than the fact that she worked 150% every minute of her waking life, which was probably about 20 hours a day every day of her life, was that she was a phenomenal motivator. And her little trick that she used in raising each of her kids was all around motivation and organizational skill. This is what she did. She would announce when she brought each child home from Holy Name Hospital what she thought that child's gift was. I can remember I was maybe, maybe nine when Tommy came home and he was the most thrilling because she unwrapped him in front of us. The minute she got home, she said, come meet your brother Thomas. He's going to be a magnificent dancer. And she showed us his fat legs and him kicking like crazy. And I remember thinking, oh man, cool, a dancer in the family. And so what did Tommy do? He grew up to be a ballet dancer, Alvin Alley Dance Theater in New York City. She was right on. Uh, she told my other sister she'd be a great nurse. My other brother, he's a born leader. She had her labels that she knocked out as though she just decided. And then she put us in the role of performing our gift for the rest of our life. So my gift was, she said, I had a wonderful imagination. And so I was the eternal babysitter. So if it was raining out, she'd say, take your kids down to the basement, take the kids down to the basement, put on a Broadway show, Barbary, and you have such a good imagination. And if it was a sunny day, I'd be out in the rock store, she'd tell me to open up a rock store in the backyard. I'm like, what's a rock store? And she'd say, you'll figure it out with your imagination. You know, kids will buy rocks if you wrap them with paper and staple them. Amazing. <laughs> But that was my mother's routine, and she did it every day of the life. God forbid you go to my mother with any argument with any one of your siblings, she was a killer. She would immediately say, you're fighting, you're both punished. And so you never went for arbitration of your fights. When my mother said that I had a wonderful imagination, she said it 
probably every day of my life. And when Sister Stella Marie sent me home from third grade hysterical crying because she told me I was stupid if I couldn't learn how to read, which I couldn't until I was in seventh grade, I was hysterical thinking that's what was wrong with me. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. What was my mother's answer? She said, oh, Barbara, you have a wonderful imagination. With it, you're going to learn to fill in all the blanks. End of story. No reading help, <laughs> no focus on it, just like poof, she dismissed it. If my mother had just taken it one step farther, she would have said, and you're going to take that imagination and grow up to be a real estate broker and be full of shit. But she, <laughs> but she never went quite that far. But I grew up thinking, man, I can think of stuff and say stuff that no other kid on the block could say, and I practiced that every day of my life. My father, not to not serve him well, was probably my biggest influence in being an entrepreneur. He was my mother's 11th child, actually. He worked as a printing press foreman during the day, and then he would wash those brown trucks at night. What is that, parcel post, or UPS, the ones without the names? What, which one is that? They were always had no names on, they were always brown. And on weekends, he didn't work at all. His job was to play with us. And if we had a snowy day where he couldn't get out of town, up to Patterson, New Jersey, where he worked, my mother would send him out to play with us all day long when we stayed home from school. So he would stick his 10 kids on a wooden ladder, jump on the last rung at the top of a hill in our side yard, shove us down the hill over a retaining wall and into oncoming traffic. That was my dad. He always had a weird idea of fun. And the other thing my father did is constantly get fired. And in our entire family of 10 siblings, nine of us are in business for ourselves. I credit my father fully for that because he taught us the gift of insubordination. <laughs> my father was probably, my mother said it wasn't that often, but it was that often because I have one sister who's an accountant and she adds it up. She said, yeah, dad was fired on average every year and a half. That's how it worked out. And mom got pre pregnant every year and a half, right? <laughs> And so when my father came home from work early, it was like a party time in our house. We always had to be at the table for dinner at six in our assigned places. But when my father's car rattled up to Undercliff Avenue any earlier than six o'clock, we left what we were doing, ran in and sat down at the table and waited for him to come to the table. My mother would hurry up to dinner and get it on the table as quick as she could. And all he'd have to do is say, guess what kids? And all of us would scream, you were fired? And then he'd go, yep, and I told Mr. Stein to go shove it up his, you know what. We'd go, yay, Dad! <laughs> it was like living with John Wayne or some superhero, and that was our father. We couldn't believe how brave he was, that he quit his job, not five one for weeks, until he got another one, and my mother, of course, would have to worry about how she was going to feed ten kids. My father and mother loved us for left, right, inside and up, and how lucky we were, were we, because I think we all left that little household feeling very confident that we were loved. And where do kids get confidence from? Usually from being overloved, is my, my impression. And I use that in building the Corcoran Group. Overloving every day of my life, every one of my agents, killing myself for them, slitting my veins for them, doing whatever I could do to make them successful. I simply did to my agents what my mother did, and then on the other side I did what my father did. I made sure we had fun. I'll get more back on that later. I want to jump forward now to 23 years old. I'm a waitress at the Fort Lee Diner, which is the fancy town right above our little town of Edgewater. And I'm standing there one night, those glass doors open, and in walked Ramon Simone. Ramon Simone with an accent on each A in each name. So fancy. I took one look at Ramon. I knew I'd be losing my virginity within the month. And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't even though I was saving it. It's just nobody had asked me for it. And so he asked to sit at my counter, and that's when the love of my life came into my heart. He offered me a ride home that night. He was 10 years older than me. I didn't know that at the time. He had a real suit on with a real starch collar. I had never seen a man in a suit until Ramon Simone walked in. It wasn't that kind of town. He gave me a ride home in a yellow Lincoln Continental with a bump on the back. And I remember sliding into those leather seats and wondering if he had sprinkled them with talcum powder. I had never felt leather against my skin before. That was a turn on too. 
And so he drove me down the hill to our house. I introduced him to my mother and father because I was out of there by 10.30, the late shift at the diner. And my mother hated him on sight. All I remember her saying about Ramon Simone was, I don't understand why a man that age would have an interest in a girl like you. I knew what he was interested in, which was okay with me. And then, about a month later, he said, you're so smart, you really belong in the big city. The big city being the city that I had never stepped foot in, which is right across the river, called New York City. And he offered to pay for a whole week at the Barbizon Hotel for Women which men weren't allowed in, very respectable, three blocks north of Bloomingdale's. And so he paid for that week for the Barbizon Hotel. I jumped in his Lincoln Continental and never went back to Edgewater. Why? Because I wasn't allowed back. Because my mother thought I was destined to that road of prostitution <laughs> and banished from the house. After I stayed at that week at the Barbizon, I found a job as a receptionist, got two roommates, and I was a New York City girl. Ramon gave me $100 to buy. I guess my mother, no wonder she was thinking that way. It's starting even to sound like prostitution to me. But either way, he gave me $100 to buy a New York real outfit. And I went to Bloomingdale's and bought myself lavender bell bottoms, corduroys, a lavender stretch top, and lavender boots, all for $100. And as I walked back to the Barbizon Hotel for Women, I remember singing Georgie Girl, and I thought I was it. I was so cool, you know? That was the beginning of my New York stint. Within a year, Ramon said, you know, you got a great personality. You do really well in real estate sales. Why don't you start your own business? I moved in with him. I started my own business. Then I found out he had three daughters. They moved in with us, three young girls. I became Mrs. Mom. Whoa, what a surprise. <laughs> and then what happened was Ramon gave me the $1,000, thank God, to start my business. Where would I have gotten $1,000 for? You might sound, it might to you sound like not a lot of money, but now think back then, it was probably the equivalent today of maybe $10,000, $15,000. Where would you come up with $10,000, $15,000 if you're a poor kid where somebody says, you'd be great, take the money, right? He took 51% of the partnership. I took 49%. After all, he explained, he was the guy that was investing the money. So he was at risk, which he was. And I made a very happy partnership. He continued to build one-family houses in New Jersey during the day while I started hiring rental agents whenever I had a spare buck. And we started building the business that way. I had a very simple formula, and all it was was when my $1,000 was coming down, I tried to make that commission bang, and then I'd be a little ahead of the 1000 I'd take that difference, and if it could pay, for four weeks of advertising on a New York Times spot ad, a three-line ad times four, I knew I had the money to hire another agent because I could place an ad for them. And I followed that formula for the next eight years. Every time I had that much more money, I'd divide by the spot ads and hire another agent. And that's the simple formula I used for building the beginning of the Corcoran Simone company with an accent on the Simone. <laughs> Very nice. We built the company together. We built his family together. We were doing very well. We had 14 agents, rental agents, and then one night Ramon Simone came home and I remember I was dumping the pasta in the sink for the girls and he said, I have something serious to discuss and he said, I'm going to marry your secretary. <laughs> Tina? That bitch is what I thought right away, <laughs> who was perfectly fine just a minute before. <laughs> and yes, of course, it was Tina. And what did Tina have that I didn't have that I wondered about for the next year? She was 10 years younger than me, long blonde hair, <laughs> better looking, and all Ramon was doing was trading me in for a new model. Now I see that, okay? He told me to take my time moving out. I took about a minute, grabbed a toothbrush, and moved into the couch of my best friend, Kathy Gilson, on East 79th Street. And we continued the company named Corcoran Simone. I went in every day to work, I don't know how I did that because honestly, I felt like I was almost acting or I was in somebody else's body. Because what I didn't really realize then is that when Ramon Simone wasn't my boyfriend anymore, my self-esteem went out the door with him. And I'm embarrassed to admit that. I had already had a business that had 14 agents who loved me. We were doing fine. I even had just started taking an actual salary, not a lot, but a salary. Everybody was happy. The market was happy. And yet, I was an empty shell wondering where I'd find my confidence. Why? In the hindsight, I see it. Because foolishly, I thought, 
Ramon had found me at the diner. He'd given me the thousand dollars. He believed in me. He took me out of my parents' home. He took me to the big city. He said I could do it. And if you really think about it, all of my self-esteem was built on what he believed about me. And so, I went into a tumble for about a year. I don't know why it took so long. It's almost stupid in hindsight. I should have had more confidence, but I lost it. And then one day, I don't know what clicked, but I just walked in on a Friday morning and said, hey, guess what, Ray? As he and Tina were sitting in my old office, because we shared an office and now she shared the office, and they were now married, Mr. and Mrs. Simon. And, and I couldn't fire her, because he reminded me he was the controlling partner just as well. But anyway, I walked in on a Friday morning and I said, you know what? I'm going to end this business and let me tell you how we're going to do it. I turned into some evil witch. And I said, we're going to cut up the business just like a football draw. You're going to pick the first person, I'll pick the second, I'll, you pick the third. And we did exactly that. We sliced the salespeople right in half. He decided he wanted to stay, that I should go. That's all right. I got him to pick first. He decided he wanted the phone number, no problem. I was going, I get my own phone number. We had a great phone number, a memorable one that I hated to give up. And then I walked out the door. And I told my salespeople, my seven, I collected them together, I said, I'm going to call you over the weekend, we're moving offices on Monday, and I'll call you and let you know where to show up for work. And in those days, as unbelievable as it was, you could call up and get a phone installed within 24 hours. I don't think you could do that today, right? A landline, okay? I was able to go down to 42nd Street, buy seven hot desks, metal desks, you just pay cash, the guys actually deliver it to your office. That day they stole it from somebody, what do they care? Okay. <laughs> I negotiated a lease that Friday afternoon with the same landlord. I moved into the 11th floor in identical space to what Ray had on the 8th floor. I kind of liked that for my ego, kind of like his agents got out at 8 and I said, see you, as I went to 11, you know, little ego where you grab it when you can. And that was the beginning of the Corcoran Group. Everyone came to work on Monday morning with working phones, working desks, and I bought 14 desks knowing I'd fill the other eight desks with agents as I could afford it, as I always did before. That was the birth of the Corcoran Group. Thank God I had the birth of the Corcoran Group. In hindsight, if Ramon hadn't fallen in love with Tina, and now they're still married, probably a lot more happy than I am with my husband Bill of 25 years, they've had three children on their own, okay? Another three children, so he has six girls, okay? So it was of course meant to be, but I couldn't see that then. All I knew is it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life, but in hindsight, it was indeed, like all bad things, the best thing that ever happened in my life. Of course, Ray gave me the insurance policy the day I walked out the door that I didn't know then how powerful that was going to be for the rest of my life is when he gave me the courtesy of an insult that I would never succeed without him. And let me tell you, I knew that I would rather, I would rather kill my young than let that guy see me go down. And you know what? It was just the way life happened. But for me, it was like, no way, Jose. And so on all those junctures, and you're all in the real estate business, you know the market goes up, it goes down, you make money on the up, you can make money on the down, you starve to death on the in-between because nobody knows which way the market's going. And so in those markets then, when I had tried everything, was over leveraged, owed money, owed the ad agency, owed whatever, and I thought I could never stay in business another minute, I would think of those words. And what do you think I would do? I would think of one more idea, one more angle to work, and that was always the angle that got me through. If Ramon had said to me that day, you know, you've done a great job, you're amazing, and you're really going to do well, I'm sure about it, I don't think I would be in business for more than the next three years, honest to God. He must have had my number, because I'm one of those type of chicks that likes to get motivated by insult, I guess. Sick to admit, but it is what it is, it is. He was wrong when he said I wouldn't succeed without him, and I sold my business almost 15 years to the day for $66 million cash, thank God. <laughs> Don't clap on that. I'm already pissing away that money on uh, Shark Tank, so <laughs> not really, not all of it, but a lot of it, trust me. Okay. <laughs> what are the lessons you learn along the way? The one thing you can say about the real estate business, anyone who's been in it, you will never, ever have a boring day as a real estate salesman. It is never, ever, ever, ever boring. Is it tedious, upsetting, insulting, <laughs> abusive, thrilling, <laughs> but never boring? It's just a word that does not apply. And so I learned in my career in building my Corcoran group that it was never boring. And I learned something every day. I have to say something every day. I didn't realize it until I ran into the same problem again and knew I had a solution. But what I did learn is major lessons of what to repeat again and again that was gonna push my little business ahead.
The first one I learned is that perception creates reality. This is the one thing my mother was dead wrong on. She was a devout Catholic and she used to tell all of us, you know, the meek will inherit the earth. She read that in the Bible or something. She never visited New York City, let me tell you. In New York City, you're the least bit meek. People chew you up and spit you out. And so I learned, number one, that if you wanted to be somebody in a town like New York, you had to look bigger and better and smarter than you actually were. If you could put out a picture of yourself better or where you wanted to go, people fall for it if you have the courage to put it out. And so when I rented my very first apartment for $340 in business as Corcoran Group, I ran out, rented that apartment. I was so thrilled. I made that money, made that money. What did I do with the $340 now? $1,000 minus $340, okay, not a lot of money left over. I immediately ran over to Bergdorf Goodman's. I cashed a check at Citibank on the way on 59th Street and bought the fanciest coat I could even find, and there's a picture of it there, okay? It doesn't look bad, but let me tell you, it was ugly. It had rat hair on the cuffs, on the collar. It had Chinese bone handles. It had a herringbone thing, but let me tell you, I put on that coat over my New Jersey outfit, and let me tell you, I was the it girl, and I wore that coat for the next five years up and down the streets of Manhattan feeling like the fancy lady I wanted to become. When I published the Corcoran Report, I, I published it out of sheer need. I couldn't advertise for my sales, sales people, and I remember Lorraine Friedberg had come into my office and whined and whined to me about, we're not advertising. How do you expect me to make money if we're not advertising? I remember thinking at the time, if I had a gun in my desk, I would have taken it out and killed her. <laughs> It was just one of those days, but she got me so fired up. I'm like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? And so I decided to take the 11 sales we had for the year, divide, add them up, divide by 11. I came up with a 54,000 and change price, and I typed up on my little Selectric typewriter, average apartment price. And then I put on the top the Corcoran Report. And then I gave it a fancy byline. I don't even remember what it was, but it was two lines long. Like conditions and trends of the larger New York City real estate market, some bullshit thing like that. And I made 27 copies of that Corcoran report, folded them. It was one page with one number. That's all it was. And I sent it out to everyone who had written for the New York Times that day. The sports writers, the business writers, anyone who had a name under a title that I thought was interesting, I mailed them a report. No one ever called. I never got free advertising. I thought maybe somebody would get hooked in on this new idea I had. But one week later, one week and a half later, I'm at home on a Sunday morning. I opened up the New York Times, the real estate section, which was then the internet, because everything in real estate was advertised there. It was that thick like a phone book, and everybody read it. I opened up the front page, and on the front page was the title, New York City real estate prices hit all-time low. I held my breath, read the first line, and it said, according to Barbara Corcoran of the Corcoran Group. And I said, holy shit. <laughs> this is the Catholic miracle mom was always talking about. And I took my scissors and cut that out, according to Barbara Corcoran, and I taped it to my pink princess phone which you paid an extra dollar a month for. What the heck, I was fancy. And I looked at that and I knew I had a partner in my real estate business and it was no longer Ramon Simone. I decided it was gonna be the New York Times. Because when I went into the office on that Monday, things had changed. We still had the same agents, we still sitting at the same desk, we still didn't have advertising, but as my agents were cold calling for listings, which is the only way you got listings prior to the MLS, for the first time, I heard John Beckman, my German agent, say, oh, you've heard of us? I had never heard that about us. Oh, you've heard of us? We had a familiarity to our name that only the New York Times article could have brought. I could have probably spent a lot of money on advertising over two years, but I learned right then and there there's no, nothing in building a brand more powerful than a third party endorsement. And I had it there in the New York Times. And that set me free to become a specialist in creating perception. And so when my arch rivals, the giant companies, were getting all the celebrities that were moving into Central Park West after John Lennon was shot, there was a big wave of celebrities that came in onto Central Park West. We had none. 
I happened to hear that morning on the radio that Madonna was pregnant with her first child, and I churned right out a Madonna report. What did the Madonna report say? It had a list of what Madonna would be looking for. More space, of course she's pregnant. Doorman services, she was already in a doorman building on off Central Park West. Views. The same thing every rich guy in New York is looking for. And I published my little list, and this time I sent it to the editor, I didn't even know it was called producer, editor of the different networks and sent them by messenger. And I was interviewed on three different 11 o'clock news, and when the last stuffy guy introduced me, tonight we have with us celebrity broker Barbara Corcoran. I'm like, holy gosh, should I correct him? And what do you think happened? I didn't get Madonna. I always wish I had that ending. But I did get a call the next day from a man. I remember the way he phrased it. I said, this is something special. He said, I wonder if you might consider working with my client. Nobody ever talked to me like that. I might be available. Who's your client? <laughs> and who was it but Richard Gere? Now, who would you rather have, Madonna or Richard Gere? I'm asking the women in the room. <laughs> and he had just made Pretty Woman. He was hot. Right? And so I sold Richard Gere a tiny little two bedroom that he converted to a purple temple down on West 12th Street in the village. Right? Whatever you're into, right? And then I published a Richard Gere report, and then I published the next report, and then I published the next report. And I constantly published a report on anything I wanted to be long before I was it. And you know what happens in life? Then you have to run like hell to actually become what you told everybody you were. And so I found that. Every time I published a report, I began to own that market. When I published a top 10 condo survey, I added up the top 10 condos. There were only maybe nine buildings in New York. And Donald Trump at the time had built a building above the Bonwit Teller building on Fifth Avenue. And he was advertising the most expensive address in the world, Trump Tower. The most expensive address in the world, Trump Tower. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. How does he know it's the most expensive in the world? And so I went down to the city hall to check out the prices, and I found out he was buying extra tax stamps to inflate his prices. And when I eliminated that, I found out he was on my list of 10 developers, number nine, not number one, and his Trump Tower was the ninth most expensive, not the top. And so when I sent him my report over by messenger with my little note, I thought, Mr. Trump, you might want to see this before I release it to the press. I was called to his office immediately. <laughs> What do you think happened in his office? I was in trouble, I didn't have the solution, but sitting there with that big guy, ah, blah, 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 with his hair going all when he was young. <laughs> I was so scared. Of course, people are good under pressure. Everybody is. And I thought of a solution. And I suggested that maybe, rather than doing it on a price per foot, we should do it on a price per room, because his rooms were the tiniest, cheapest rooms in town, and he might inflate up the list. And when we recalculated it together with his office staff, we put Mr. Trump in first, second, and third position. Truthful, but I made a friend. And so we took a full page in the New York Times, a court, no, I'm sorry, the first one read in the New York Times was Trump Tower, the most expensive address in the world in a star. And on the bottom it says, the Corcoran Report. And he called me, how'd you like the ad? I said, my name looked a little small. <laughs> And so we took a full page ad out that following Friday in the Wall Street Journal, and it said, according to the Corcoran Report, Trump Tower, <laughs> better. <laughs> Would I have gotten Mr. Trump as an advocate or his listings or the, all the business we did over the years if I wasn't thrown out that bullshit? You betcha I wasn't. Would I have gotten Richard Gere, who begot the next celebrity, who begot the next celebrity without putting out the Madonna report, I would not have, trust me. I would have had to earn it the hard way, the long way that would have taken me 15 years because I and my agents did not have the contacts. But we created the contacts by putting out the reports and creating the perception that we had them to begin with. And I used that methodology for my entire career, and that's what built a brand faster and bigger than any other way that I had ever developed. Okay. Number two, I found that there are only two kinds of people at work, maybe in life, but I limit it to work. There are expanders and there are containers. And the quicker you can chop people into those two piles of people at work, the faster you are and the better judgment you'll make at putting people in the right job. The day that Esther Kaplan walked in, she became my business partner for the next 15 years, but the day she walked in, she was an executive secretary, the most modest, contained, rigid woman I probably had ever laid eyes on, and she said she wanted to be a real estate salesperson. I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, no way, baby, you couldn't sell anything. And as I was trying to usher out of the office to get onto the next interview as quick as I could, 
I lied and I said, we don't have a desk available. I actually had like 20 at the time. We don't have a desk available. Take my card and I'll call you if something opens up. And as luck would have it, she took my card, put it on a bone clip of some kind. And I remember she went, I remember the conciseness of that sound. And she took my business card and she hovered over her purse and tipped it and filed it. And as she tipped it, she had inside that purse dividers. It was a miniature file cabinet. Is that weird? With labels. You ever see that crap? I never saw it ever again. <laughs> I looked at Esther and I said, you know, Esther, I think there is going to be a position open. I'd like to talk to you about it. Could you come back next week? I would like to personally train you myself. I'd like to teach you everything I know about sales. You could actually be my right arm. We could work together. We could be a team. She couldn't believe the change in the weather. Why was I lying through my teeth about how good she was going to be? Because I knew I had just met my business partner. I thought if a woman like that could keep a purse that neat, she could sure keep my growing business in order, which was becoming more disheveled by the day. The quicker I grew, the more disheveled it became. And so Esther became the best business partner I could have ever, ever imagined. Why? Because she was my opposite. She was the consummate container and I was the consummate expander. I was good at PR, I was good at recruiting, I was good at advertising, I was good at fun, I was good at all the things that that kind of personality likes to do, but I wasn't good at the other stuff. Esther was good at computer systems, filing systems, hiring people, policies, getting credit lines for the bank. I would go in and say, could we increase our $100,000 credit line to 150? They would say no. I'd send Esther in with the exact same balance and she'd, she'd go in there and come back with a $500,000 credit line. Why was that? They trusted her. They didn't trust me. Right? And they're right, actually. All right. I was trying to spend money around Esther's back my entire career, but I would see that money coming in three months in advance. She would see it six months in advance and lock it up and not let me get my hands on it. Right? If I had an ad agency who presented three phenomenal campaigns and I'm looking at them, I would run them right into Esther and say, Esther, here are the new campaigns, um, which she didn't like me even spending money on ad campaigns, but here are the new campaigns, Esther, which, which one do you like best? I could have knitted a sweater in the time she took to look at those boards. Sitting there, looking, looking, I'm like, oh God. And she'd say, well, anyone except that one. And that was the one I ran with because that's how bad she was at advertising. It was an insurance policy. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not knocking her because she was just as good, you know, she was opposite in every way. So I found in building powerhouse super people, superstar salespeople at my company, my job was to take that beautiful expander, because every great salesperson is uh, an expander, okay, and wrap as many containers around them as I possibly could. All right? And I found their departments grew exponentially. They became businesses within my business. And I had no qualms about spending the money because the more I could help them with containment, the higher they flew and the more money they made for me. And so the point there, I think I ran into the ground, is there's really only two kinds of people, expanders and containers. And the quicker you can figure out who the person is and put them in the right job, the smarter you are going to be at building your own business. Number three, anything not changing really ain't working. I found this. If I had anything in my business that hadn't changed in a while, I didn't realize it, but it was already failing. So I started to target things in my business that I knew we hadn't changed up. Why? Not that they weren't working, it seemed fine, but soon enough they weren't working anymore. And you know what that did for me? It made me the innovator in my business because I was always reinventing everything along the way. And interestingly, you know what I found my greatest salespeople were doing just like me is they were reinventing all the time, all the time. Not just accommodating the excess that they got, but questioning, what am I doing? How do I do this? How do I do more of it? They were greedy. They wanted to do more and do different things all the time. And I found that that was a mark of a great, great salesperson. If they didn't have it, if they were just doing the same thing and doing more of it, they never became the king or the queen in the sales force. They became good, but they were never the top. And so my Carrie Chiangs, my Robbie Browns, my Sharon Bounds, my, uh, what's her name, Chandler, I always forget her for his name, don't tell her, uh, blah, 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 whatever, forget it. <laughs> they were all amazing salespeople, but constantly reinventing themselves all the time. And I, as a business owner, was constantly reinventing the corporate group all the time. I remember I was thinking, how do we get people to see 
properties differently. And I came up with the genius idea. I said, I'm going to put all these properties on videotape. This was long before the internet. And I thought this way we could just hand them out and people could choose their apartments at home. So I made one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom videotapes. And I had everybody's makeup done. I put the agent saying hello with their name and phone number. And then this was the property. And the cameras went through the property. Oh my God, no one even thought of this. And I had thought of it. And I announced it to my salespeople. I said, we're going to call it Homes on Tape, H-O-T for hot. Homes on tape, yay, yay, yay. They thought it was the greatest. Well, of course, I spent around Esther's back because I signed her signature on the check. I'd never do that ever again. I spent $77,000 on videotapes, okay? And what do you think happened? They were dead on arrival. So I'm sitting in the basement of my little shop next to Zabar's on the west side, sitting there in piles of these black tapes, the bottom one's soaking up water. I'm so depressed. I'm scared to go up and see Esther. I'm scared to go out in the street and I'm ashamed of myself. And so I was starting to feel sorry for myself and my husband Bill was a Navy captain, uh, weekend warriors they call them, and he had just come back from playing war games, which he did every single year in South Korea where all these Navy guys, only men could do this, get together and they bomb the crap out of the North Koreans on, on pretend, right? They're doing this, they're doing this, and Bill comes home and he's so excited, he can't believe it, he's telling me about how amazing it is. I'm like, Bill, you do this every year, how amazing could it be? He said, no, no, this time it was different. We did it on this new thing called the internet. We were bombing them in real time. You know, you press the button, you saw the bomb. And I'm like, what's this new thing called the internet? Next day I took all my videos, I registered Corcoran.com, threw all those videos right on Corcoran.com, and boom, boom, within one week we had two sales out of London. What do you think that meant? So I immediately went and registered every one of my competitors' URLs that day. <laughs> Not because I wanted to steal them, but I wanted to know when they were going to wake up. I knew I had just stepped in a pot of gold. And I knew I could see how that was going to change real estate forever. And I just wanted to know when other people found out. I just got lucky. And so I announced to my salespeople, we're going to take the videos stage two. They didn't know it was a failure. Stage two into cyberspace. Ah, I had explained what cyberspace was. I was so cool. I got all these terms down. <laughs> and that's what we did. Do you know? What a huge advantage was to my little company to be on the internet almost three full years before I got my first phone call. And guess who called first? Not the big companies, the little companies. And guess who called last? The two biggest games in town were the last two calls I got. You have my URL. No problem. I'll give it back. But that's what a lead I had. How lucky was that? Would I have gotten that if I hadn't seeked sought, whatever the word is, change. Absolutely not, okay? So my best salespeople reinvented. I, as the company crawling up the ranks, was a reinventor, and it was essential to the business. Number four, I learned from my dad, fun is good for business. When we rode on that ladder down the side yard, it was nuts, we got hurt. I can't even know how my father's back, because the last guy on is the one that hits the hardest, right? When you come off the wall. But you know what, we laughed and we knew we were the best family in town. We weren't really, but for that moment, we thought we were the best, luckiest family in town. And so I discovered fun quite by accident at the Corcoran Group. I had a little extra money. I got Esther's blessing and I hired an open aired bus, but I didn't tell the salespeople what was going to happen. I said, on Friday night, we're going to go on a special thing. I'm not telling you what we're doing. It's going to be fun. I want you to wear your best outfits, your best jewelry, and really freshen up your makeup at the end of the day. Really go all out. We are going to have a ball. Where are we going? I can't tell you, where are we going? I got my money's worth by the time Friday rolled around already because everybody talked about it. I wonder where we're going, I wonder where we're going. And so when they came down, I had that nice big open aired bus and I'm on top, come on and sit up here, come on and sit up here, it's sunny, yeah, yeah, yeah. They all came up, all like, where are we going? We're going on a nice slow tour of Harlem when Harlem was the scariest place on earth. <laughs> Why was that good? because it was exciting. And so when we rolled up into Harlem, in and out those summer streets with everybody on their stoops, my women were clasping their necklaces. I had only one black salesperson, V. Wilson at the time. She helped me plan it. She came up with the genius idea. Let's have the bus break down on 145th Street in Amsterdam. 
When that bus broke down and that guy left the bus, V's memory of it, as she said, I couldn't make better words than she said, she said, I felt like a Maytag pole with eight white women clinging to me. <laughs> Here's what happened when we got off that trip and people were happy to get home. The business again had changed. I could feel it. I remember walking in and seeing Sharon Bowne and Carrie Chiang. Sharon coming up, Carrie's rear as the top salesperson. She never actually pulled that off. Sitting together, not sitting, standing together and talking. And they were hitting each other like old pals at a bar. They hated each other. What were they doing? They were sharing what they were thinking when the bus broke down. Whoa, 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 whoa. And people for the entire next week compared, what were you thinking? Da, da, da. It almost got in the way of work. But what I realized is I had created a culture at the Corcoran Group, a culture where everybody somehow got hooked together because they were in danger and had fun together. And I started becoming the party queen. And so we had our February sweetheart parties faithfully every year. Every company has parties, but we did them differently. We did them always in February because you get everything half price because nobody has parties in February in New York for some reason. I don't know why that is. Tax time? I don't know. So you can negotiate a great deal. Everybody brought their sweetheart. We called them sweetheart parties, but the gimmick was you had to dress as I told you. And I had gimmicks. So come in your pajamas, dress in pink, dress 1940s, and if you weren't dressed, you didn't get in. First year or two, some people refused to dress, and I turned them away. By year three and four, everybody dressed. When I had my final party before selling the business, it was cross-dress. I had a petition signed by the straight men. They said they would not cross-dress. Well, guess what? They all cross-dressed. They wouldn't dare miss the best party in town. And so what we had is we had a culture of fun, excitement all the time. We went out to movies instead of having sales meetings, bring them over for a sales meeting and say, we're having a movie. What? Okay, whatever you could do to change it up and make people laugh. And you know what I found? I found my agents became my recruiters because everybody was saying, well, you know what I did last night? What did you do? Everybody was like, what happened at your party this year? And so why would you want to work for my arch rival and get the same commission splits, the same swanky Madison Avenue office, the same this, the same advertising, when you can get all of that and come over to Corcoran Group and get your shoes shined on every Monday morning, get the massages at your desk on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and get your nails done on Wednesday. Why would you do that? Okay, it's much more fun at my place. Why wouldn't you come over? And I literally stopped recruiting, which was always my major job because my agents did it for me. There's no substitute for fun. And yet today in most businesses, it's the most underutilized card. When I sold my business to Senden Corporation, NRT, you know NRT doesn't even stand for anything? Is that the weirdest thing? Only men would think of that one. All right, it took me a year to find that one out, okay. But when I sold my business uh, to NRT or Senden, whatever they were then, um, uh, I was worried that they were going to think I was a spendthrift. Why would I worry about that because of how much money I spent on parties and stuff? And you want to know something? Esther told me my total budget was like less than 1% of the company dollar. I got, trust me, 20% out of that 1% because I was smart enough to make sure people were always having fun. All right, number five, there's no such thing as balance. When I had my first baby at 46, it was kind of odd. I was a little old. I didn't know what to do because I was a super mom at work, 150% at work, and I wanted to be a super mom at home, and I found like I was drawn and quartered. I remember Carrie Chiang walked into my office one morning because I came in at 9 o'clock instead of 7.30 when she usually came in. And she walked up to my office and she said, you don't care about me no more, you just care about that boy. <laughs> and I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe this. But she was right. I did care about her. But she knew I was caring about the business less because I wasn't there at 7.30. I was home with my kid. And so I had to really wrestle with how do you get balance between the workforce and your home. And it was a tough one and I sought out all kinds of things, but in the end I only concluded there is no such thing as balance. And what I've substituted for balance, and now I have two kids, and I sold my business six years or four years or five years after that, but what I substituted long before I sold the business, and I've done ever since, because now I'm involved in a lot of businesses and a lot of pulls in different directions, is I've learned to do two very simple things. Put a line between my home and my work, an ironclad line that nobody dare passes. And what that means is when I'm at home, I'm 150% at home. When I'm at work, I'm 150% at work. And I know in the real estate business, this was a very hard thing to do because your client is constantly on you. They expect to hear from you. But I learned the great beauty now with all of the people I'm working with is saying, I will be an automatic message. I'll be checking my voicemails tomorrow at 8.30. 
that's it. And when I go home at night, what do I do? I don't even go into my apartment because I have a shared uh, elevator landing with myself and my neighbor's apartment. I plug it in in the hallway, my phone, and I don't look at it till I walk out at 8.30 the next morning. Very hard for me to do because I'm addicted to cleaning things up and answering every email. But once I could skin that cat, I got my family life back. And I've been doing that for probably six years. On vacations when I'm home. If my husband Bill wants to get a hold of me during the work day, he's got to lie and pretend he's in New York Times or something to get through. <laughs> Who cares, all right? If my kids one, if there's an emergency, even in the parents directory, which I thought maybe made me look shameful, but I'm so happy I did it. Emergency number, I don't even have my number or my husband's. I have my secretary's number. If somebody wants a play date, they call my secretary. Not that I'm trying to look pompous, because now I have an eight-year-old, but because I need a dividing line. When I'm at work, I'm a work person. And when I'm at home, I'm a home person. And that has been how I've redefined for myself finding, finding balance or forgetting that it exists. All right, number six. I learned over the years that one of the big reasons I succeeded so well at building a big business was because I was really great at failing. I just know I'm a great failure. Even when I got the new job at Shark Tank, I was asked if I would go on Shark Tank as one of the Shark Judges, which is a show on Friday night. And if you're not TV watchers, you doubt whether you have any time for TV if you're in this business, right? But when I got that uh, inquiry, I said, definitely. I signed the contract without looking. I bought myself three autograph outfits. I pictured myself in Hollywood signs, signing autographs. This is my new life. I love it. I love it. I love it. But what do you think happened? They changed their mind. One week before I was supposed to go, they said, we changed our mind, we hired another woman. I knew she was younger, I knew she had bigger boobs and she had longer blonde hair, and guess what, I was right, okay. But <laughs> I couldn't believe my misfortune. I could already see me in that new career, buying young businesses, helping them to success. It was right up my alley. And so I sat down and wrote an email to Mark Burnett, probably the best known producer who owned that company in LA, and I said, dear Mark, I appreciate you considering me as a fallback for the future position of Shark, but I'm accustomed to coming in first. All of my worst, best successes happened on the heels of failure. And I told Matt, Sister Stella Marie, Ramon Simone, Donald Trump said I'd never see a penny of the $5 million commission he owed me until I sued him and won in court. Boom, bada boom, just bullets like that, maybe five. And I said, I'll buy my own ticket. Why don't you have both women come out and compete for the seat? And that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly why I got my seat in Shark Tank. Again, I was great at failure. I remember when I gave my first speech, not unusual, I've learned since I lost my voice and the guy twice asked me to sit down in front of a room full of city bankers. I was mortified because I'd practiced for a whole month and I said I would never speak again. But the next day, I guess I was good at getting up because I went and I volunteered to teach at NYU at night on the one thing I knew how to do, which was to sell real estate. And I taught 11 students for 12 weeks how to sell real estate two evenings a week, two hours each evening. And who appeared in my first class? Carrie Chiang, the Asian tycoon who is still the number one agent in all of New York City. She came up to me on the break in the middle of the class and she said, and forgive my accent, imitation, she loves it, she asked me to do it for her all the time. She says to me, she said to me, you're not much money, Mag. I'm like, excuse me? You're not trying to tell money I make, which was, do you know how much money I make? <laughs> okay, and I said, no, how much money do you make? 250,000 six months. My top agent, Norma Hirsch, was making sixty-two, sixty-three thousand $63,000 a year. And Carrie was making two fifty in six months. Well, don't you think I turned into a great teacher for her? Because I had one singular goal, I was going to recruit that babe into my company if it was the last thing I did. And what do you think happened after the course was over? I was a phenomenal teacher. I talked just to Carrie, to Carrie. And she moved into my company and the big bonus was she brought three of her Asian cousins carrying the file cabinets. I got that, okay, the files of hers. But they stayed and worked for her for free. I had three free employees. Carrie Chiang became the number one agent in Manhattan because she was on to the new phase of the condominium just when every New Yorker was saying they would never move into a condo because you don't know who lives next door to you. She was early, she was up, she sold 70% of Mr. Trump single-handedly, 70% of all of the product he was going to build over the next four years. What do you think that did to my bottom line? Carrie Chiang from that point on was always producing almost 70% of my entire company income no matter how many agents I hired because the more agents I hired the bigger she got, the bigger she got, the more people I put around her. 
that I was happy to pay for after that, all right? So what was going on there? I was failing well. I remember there was one point I was writing a speech to say goodbye to everybody because I really was way in debt. Interest rates are 18%. No one was buying any properties in Manhattan at all. Why would they? 18%? Nobody knew the sky was falling, blah, blah, blah. And I was approached by an insurance company asking if I could unload 88 apartments, but they refused to have an auction. Too bad, we should have known this group then, right? You wouldn't have wanted these apartments. They were the dregs of the markets. They were disgusting. Some had kitchens, some had baths. They were scattered throughout Manhattan's Upper East and Upper West Side. Not first class buildings at all. I looked at a few of the apartments. I reported back, no, I'm sure you've talked to every agent in town. These are unsaleable, sorry. But that night, I remember my mom took us to a puppy sale in Tom's River to visit my grandpa and the lady who was across the street, we call her the chicken farmer. She was actually selling Jack Russell puppies and she had advertised in the New York Times Jack Russell puppies and there were like 12 people from New York waiting in line and my mother said, Look at Louise, she's really smart. She sat us down on the edge of that drive. She said, look at Louise, she's really smart. You know what she did? She invited all of these New York fancy people at the same time. And so there were 12 people wanting puppies and she only had six. And what do you think happened to those puppies? Even the last puppy that the disgusting one with piles of makeup on, I remember, took. And she said, isn't he cute? Even we as little kids could tell that dog was going to be dead within the hour. But why did she grab that puppy and why was she so excited? Because there weren't enough to go around. There just weren't enough to go around. And they all wanted them at the same moment in time. And for whatever reason, it popped into my head. I ran right back to Equitable Insurance. I said, I have a plan to sell you units. If you trust me on this, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I did. I added up what they wanted for all the units. I divided by 88. And I priced them all alike. Makes no sense, right? But I announced to my salespeople a week from Monday. I was hoping to God I could stay in business, that the landlord wasn't going to close me down. A week from Monday, we're going to have a private sale. Only tell your relatives and only tell your single best customer. Only bring one customer because there aren't enough to go around. What is it? What is it? 88 apartments, all priced at like. High floors, low floors, views, kitchens, no kitchens. Whoever comes early is going to get the pick of the litter. And so when I handed out that list, you would swear it was a Macy's Day sale. The same 88 apartments that nobody wanted for the last year and a half flew off the shelf in less than an hour and a half, and I made over a million dollars net commission. Bang! How did that happen? I had discovered the number one rule in sales. Everybody wants what everybody wants, and nobody wants what nobody wants, and I created a frenzy because it looked like everybody wanted it. Why? Because I had 88 apartments, and people didn't obey my orders. They had four or five customers and relatives waiting in line, so we had over 150 people in line waiting for the 88 apartments. And so the last guy who got the runt of the litter was like, ha, na, 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 he was so happy because everybody behind him was screaming, unfair, we didn't even get the list, unfair. <laughs> <laughs> and thank God for that sale because it brought me out of the market and just by coincidence, God has a sense of humor. All of a sudden, the market turned around, not because of my sale, it just happened that way. I rented a brand new office, moved my original office, had two offices overnight. Why? Because I was good at failure. That's all it was. I was looking for another way, one more way to stay in business, on and on and on. I feel like I've talked too much. I'm so sorry about Carrie Chiang. She would love me. She should pay me for giving her this publicity and she never would. She's a cheapest person you ever want to meet. <laughs> but let me give you one more Carrie Chiang. I didn't mean to be, I kind of got on, on, uh, stuck on the Carrie Chiang thing, but I actually put her in a slide, so I'm going to have to tell you this. This is a picture of poetry in motion and salesmanship. Something went on with Taiwan. I'm watching the 11 o'clock news with Bill one night, and I see whatever went on. It was a stock market crash. So I'm like, oh my god, that's Carrie's market. Carrie's going to lose all of her business. The, the food chain's not coming anymore. And so I call Carrie. I can't reach her 11 o'clock at night. I call her up to midnight. I can't reach her. I call her on her cell phones. No answer. All day long the next day, her whole department didn't hear from her. We thought she committed Harry Carrie. And I had no solution, but I just wanted to comfort her and say, well, think of something. Well, you know, I don't worry about this. I was worried about number one, honestly. She was most of my income. If her income went out the window, what did that mean for my business? So Carrie comes into my office a little after 6 o'clock at night looking like a mess. And she's very a perfectly quaff type woman. Her makeup, her hair. She looked like somebody beat her up and she hustles into my office. She walks, walks like a bulldog really fast and, and she said, I up all night. I exhausted. And I'm like, I'm just so happy she's alive. And I go, don't worry, Carrie. I've been thinking. I up all night. I exhausted. I get 188 new listings. <laughs> <laughs> she called everyone she had ever sold to and talked them in 
to listing their apartment while their sky was falling. How do you not love somebody like that? And then <laughs> the dessert, she went out that week and hired two new agents. She didn't ask my permission. I was paying for them. I didn't care. She went out and hired two new assistants that spoke Japanese. How smart was she? Because she understood the Chinese were leaving New York and she already knew that the Japanese, however she knew, were about to come in or started to come in. And she got two assistants that spoke fluent Japanese and she converted her business to the Japanese market. And you know the Japanese don't even like the Chinese, I don't think usually, okay, but she did it. All right. And so where is Carrie's business today? It's one-third Chinese, one-third Japanese, and one-third American. When Carrie calls me every January, she does the same stupid thing. You know how much money I make? She does it the third week of every January. I'm always waiting for her to call. But now she's really irritating. She goes, I make more money than you. <laughs> how much money did Carrie Chiang make last year? I can tell you exactly. Well, not exactly, because I dropped the, the few endings. But she made $43 million selling apartments in New York. How does somebody make $43 million? She makes $43 million because I can tell you she is great at failing. And after all the years that I interviewed people to try to figure out that housewife sitting there, how do I know she's going to be a good salesperson? Or this guy who failed at this business, he's coming into real estate now, how do I know he's going to be a good person? You know what I learned to focus on? The interview to try to drill down for me to size up how good they were naturally at failing. That's not an easy thing to pick up, but I learned my trick question, that the bobbed and weaved. Because I found that the two great traits that every great salesperson has is enormous empathy, and you all know it. When the customer says black, you can sometimes feel the real color they're talking about is pink. When they say they only want the, uh, the they must have a pre-war with high ceilings and moldings and everything. If you're wise in the business, you know often you could substitute a terrace with park views. What they're really talking about is charisma, not moldings and whatever. You know how you do that switching because you have an intuitive sense about people, but yet. If you want to be the top in your field, I have never seen the top salespeople get there without being great at failure. And you want to know, the big difference is not how often they fail or what connections they have, although that helps you in the business. But once they're in the business, it comes down to how long when people get hit do they feel sorry for themselves. How long do they feel sorry for themselves? The longer they feel sorry for themselves, the worse you are at real estate sales. And of all the people I fired over my career, probably 3,000, 4,000 people personally fired, I would tell you the number one reason I had to fire the nicest, hardest working, most capable people was they couldn't take the hit. They personalized. They might be at their desk and look like they're working, but they weren't working. They were mentally not there because they were still licking their wounds. And that was responsible for getting people out of the business. And the lack of that gene, almost like a low IQ, like, hit me again. I'm too stupid. I'll stand up again. That's the mark of a great salesperson. However they do it with style or lack of style. And I learned to really focus on that to build a powerful sales force. And it's ironically exactly what I'm looking for today when I'm trying to buy into businesses on Shark Tank. Absolutely no difference. They're all just like the best salespeople. Great entrepreneurs are salespeople. They know how to keep ticking. They know how to take the hit. They push themselves ahead. And so really I'm kind of doing the same old thing for business. Isn't that kind of weird how it all works out, okay? The very last thing I wanted to say, which I forgot to put a card on, uh, but I think it's worth saying, is um, the one uh, thing that I, that I really learned to do at work, and I still do it now, and I push my entrepreneurs to do it, is I have learned to get people to be more confident about the ability to think on their feet. I generally found that we live in a world where people are overeducated, filled with expectations from affluent parents, um, that they're less willing to fall and make mistakes. And yet, I have found that with all the people I work with, if I could tell them and convince them that, you know what, you don't have the answer from where you're standing. Don't overanalyze it. Don't try to think. Don't just think, no, you're not going to do it because, because that's the kind of world we've been trained to. I have instead learned to teach people to jump out the window. Just jump out the window and guess what's going to happen? You're going to find the answer on the way down. And you know what? They always do. They always do. I think people sell themselves short no matter who they are. And I think the more you take a flyer on something and be willing that they don't all work, think of it as research and development. The big pharmaceutical companies 
how much money they piss away on research that doesn't work. Research and development. But if you could get through the door or the window and invite yourself in where you're not invited and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet, because believe me, I constantly did that to myself. I was amazed at how smart I was once I got to the other side. I always thought about it. And you know what? I learn self-pride. I think when people fail, they fail quietly, and it erodes your ego and your self-esteem and makes you realize, really, you're never going to get everything that you really wanted to get because you haven't allowed yourself to get it. I remember when Mayor Bloomberg was in the first week of office, I don't know if you remember this, was some maintenance guy that jumped down onto the railroad track because an older man had a heart attack and was sprawled across the railroad track with the train coming in at full speed ahead and this maintenance guy actually jumped down, dove into the track right before the train came, turned the man's body to run parallel with the track and laid next to him. And of course he got the, he was on the 11 o'clock news and Mayor Bloomberg was handing him the key to Manhattan and everything. You're an amazing hero. He said, how does it feel to be a hero? Little, the little mayor said, this big maintenance guy said, I didn't know I was a hero until I jumped down there. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to know, as simple as that is, I remember watching that and I remember thinking, gee, isn't that the truth with all the great people that I've had the joy of working with? And isn't that the quality that keeps people from really being their full self when, when, they're, when, they, when they don't quite do it like that, you know? And so that's my last point. I know I'm supposed to have a wrap up, but I don't. That's it. That's the end. Now you clap. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.